Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's webinar, exploring the common EPUB reading apps that offer great experiences for learners with low vision. There are some quick housekeeping items to review. Live captioning is available by simply clicking on the CC icon at the uh, bottom of the Zoom screen. You can also enlarge the captioning box by clicking on the upward arrow in the top right corner. This will be a 40 minute session with 20 minutes set aside at the end for your questions. And if at any point you have trouble seeing the bottom of the screen, simply adjust your view options in the top center of the Zoom window. To ask questions or make comments, please use the Q&A pane. Uh, you will find the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to submit your questions at any time, uh, but please note that since we may not get to them until the end, be sure to mention which software or assistive technology you're asking about. We have set up an EPUB resources page at bit.ly slash EPUB dash ATN. The QR code to the right will also take you to the site. As soon as we have that webinar recording, we post it on that page along with the PowerPoint decks. The next webinar will take place in two weeks on May 21st at 2 p.m. And we will be hearing from Cengage, McGraw-Hill, Wiley, McMillan, and Pearson about the initiatives that they have undertaken to create more accessible products. And now I'd like to turn it over to today's speakers, Richard Orm, Luis Perez, and Robin Spinks, and let them introduce themselves. And thank you so much, Richard, Luis, and Robin, for sharing your expertise with us today. Well, thank you, Dawn. So my name's Richard Orm. I'm uh, joining you from the DAISY Consortium today. Myself, I don't have low vision, uh, but for many years, um, I work with students in universities and colleges in the UK doing assessments around the assistive technology they might need because of their um, site conditions. So I have some experience from that area. And currently I work at the DAISY Consortium on accessible uh, reading systems and publishing standards. Hello everyone, my name is Luis Perez. Uh, I work for the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials or the National AIM Center for short at CAST. Uh, and I do have low vision. Uh, I was diagnosed in my early 30s. I'm in my mid 40s uh, today and my condition is retinitis pigmentosa. Hello everyone, I'm Robin Spinks. I currently work as Senior Manager for Innovation and Development at RNIB, that's the Royal National Institute of Blind People in the UK. I have low vision. I've lived all my life as someone with low vision. I have a condition called albinism. And the hardest question that I can be asked is how much can I see? Because I have no sense of deficit or loss and the vision that I have is entirely normal to me. This webinar, as I hope uh, is what you're um, showing up for, is all around the common EPUB reading apps that are used uh, particularly by people with low vision. They have features that you'll learn about as we go through and we're doing some practical demonstrations for you across Windows, iOS, Android and the Mac platforms. And the apps that we're going to show you will be relevant whether you get your EPUBs from the Access Text Network, whether you get them from Bookshare, through your library system or through the publisher or some other way. So let's move then to low vision and reading. If you could advance to the next slide, Richard. So in terms of some of the common challenges that people with low vision uh, face, uh, they range um, across a number of different conditions and uh, it could be uh, acuity or the ability to focus on the text it could be reduced contrast sensitivity, uh, sensitivity to glare, uh, which uh, could be sensitivity to certain uh, types of lighting or photophobia. Uh, the one that I'm most familiar with, which is a reduced field of vision. And uh, currently I have about uh, nine to 10 degrees of uh, central vision left. Uh, related to that, I also experience sensitivity to movement at times. 
Um, there could be perceptual differences. Uh, visual fatigue is another one that I experience uh, because uh, in order to account for the limited central vision that I have, I have to do quite a bit of scanning in order to uh, you know, be able to read the content that's in front of me. And so that can tire my eyes out by the end of the day. So my vision changes throughout the day as well. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, my so vision. Are, go ahead, Richard. So these are all very familiar to me, having met some uh, 400 or so uh, students over my career. And I guess the one that people mostly think about is the inability to focus on text and needing bigger text. Is that is that right? But we've certainly, when I was demonstrating systems to people really keen on uh, color combinations, giving them better contrast, uh, but also sometimes uh, needing to reduce the glare um, as well. Absolutely. And a lot of times, uh, some of the accommodations that I've gotten in the past was to make the text bigger. And in fact, making the text bigger because of my reduced central vision can actually uh, cause some more effort on my part. So uh, just to borrow some of the language from other communities that they use, uh, if you met a person with low vision, you've met one person with low vision. So there's quite a bit of variability uh, in our community. Um, and so just to give you a sense um, from the latest WebAIM survey from September 2018 and give you a breakdown, um, the question that was asked was, uh, which of the following types of visual impairments do you have? Uh, with visual acuity, that was the greatest number of people. Um, that's uh, issues with clarity or sharpness of the vi central vision. That was 75%. Then light and glare sensitivity was next at 61%. Uh, contrast sensitivity and limited field of vision were pretty close at uh, 47% and 49% respectively. And then color vision and color blindness, um, about one in five people or 20%. And then people who indicated other was about uh, 18%. Um, and 75% of the respondents to this WebAIM survey reported having multiple types of visual impairment. And that's not uncommon that a lot of these uh, challenges usually occur with each other in conjunction with each other. And then about 31% reported that they had four or more different types of visual challenges. And an interesting finding was that the uh, prevalence of colorblindness um, in the uh, respondents, among the respondents, uh, was about one in five or 19%, but in the general population, that's about 4%. So that kind of gives you a change, uh, gives you an overview of some of the variability that we find when we're speaking about low vision. And now, the image that you see on the screen is a Pelly robson chart that's used for uh, testing color or contrast sensitivity. There was so much variability uh, in all of this and it being such an individual thing, as you explained so well there, Lewis, I guess the critical thing here is that in the digital world, there's much more capability for an individual to customize the experience to their own needs. And at that point in time, because it could change during the day, that was so much more difficult in the physical world of, uh, of printed materials. Absolutely. Next slide. Well, what we've got here are some illustrative images that uh, demonstrate the effects of some common uh, eye conditions on the vision, particularly related to reading. Uh, we've developed them um, in conjunction with low vision clinicians and they've been reviewed, but it's really important to stress that this isn't going to give you an experience of what it's like to live with low vision, to read with low vision, nor can the slide, for example, that relates to uh, retinitis pigmentosa uh, be kind of considered that's actually what Lewis is experiencing. These are illustrative um, uh, images that we're going to look at and they're really seeking to show the variability uh, of things, but maybe if students are describing what they do have in terms of vision loss, uh, it will help to be able to refer to these um, images. So the first one we have is around cataracts, and Robin, you were going to speak to this one. That's right. Cataract is a very common cause of low vision, and it's a condition where users will often report a gradual blurring of what they're able to see. Sometimes people will be completely unaware of the impact until the condition has progressed to a level where it's beginning to impact their functioning. But people will often describe things becoming uh, more hazy, 
And indeed, if the surgery, which is available for many people who have cataract, is carried out, you, people will often report afterwards that, you know, that they noticed a loss of detail and clarity and sharpness. But again, stressing that that is often a very gradual onset. So it's quite often the case that the person with the condition doesn't actually recognize the real impact of it until um, the condition has been um, improved through, through surgery. So it's possible, a uh, very routine procedure now for many hospitals throughout the world to carry out a cataract surgery um, where the intraocular lens can be replaced, uh, giving a person much better um, vision. So that, again, just to stress, is an individual experience of it. And it's important to recognize that that will vary um, quite significantly from, from one user to another. It's also just worth mentioning at this stage that with any of these conditions, environment is absolutely critical. So if you are reading, for example, in an environment where you've got a good level of natural lighting that's comfortable to you, um, things may go well and you may have a positive experience. But if, for example, the sunlight levels were to change or it were to get dark, you may need to adjust the lighting level that you have to make sure that it's um, consistent and comfortable for you in that particular setting. And I will go ahead and speak to uh, retinitis pigmentosa and glaucoma. Um, these conditions are, um, uh, you know, they, they um, are distinct conditions, but they manifest themselves in a very similar way as a loss of the uh, peripheral vision. Uh, so as I said, this is what I um, experience. Uh, what I often tell people is to take their hands and make two small circles and then take a look at the screen through those uh, two small circles that they've made with their hands and it gives them an idea of what it's like uh, to read with retinitis pigmentosa. Um, the term that a lot of people use to uh, describe retinitis pigmentosa is tunnel vision. Because again, you're losing the photoreceptor cells in the back of the eye in the retina. And as those die off, then you're going to lose that field of vision uh, from the outside in. Um, and um, with retinitis pigmentosa, as I said, uh, it's difficult to track movement. There's other uh, issues that I experience with it. Um, I actually have very good vision on the outside, all the way on the outside, on the periphery. And then uh, I lose it somewhere in between from the periphery to the center. And so another term that people with retinitis pigmentosa often use is islands of vision because uh, that vision loss can be sort of it's not a perfect circle. Uh, it's somewhat irregular. Uh, so again, this is a condition that affects uh, the, the retina, which is the back of the eye. So next we have a slide on viewing text with diabetic retinopathy and Robin, you were going to talk us through this one. Again, diabetic retinopathy is one of the commonest eye conditions that we come across um, in the Western world. And it's something that is in fact on the increase. And what's quite uh, difficult for people to understand often is the variable nature of the condition. So people with re diabetic retinopathy will often report that they may have floaters or patches of blurred vision. And crucially, it's often the case that these patches of low vision actually move around. Now they're represented on the slide by dark areas um, that almost look like land masses on a map against a sea. Um, and that, that is, Sometimes how these will be experienced by individuals, but we're also very aware that, that that variation is present there too. Sometimes people will describe that the blotchy areas are less pronounced, they're not as dark, perhaps they're lighter. And again, the condition can vary depending on stress levels, general health, any other factors that might be influencing the individual's environment. And you can imagine, can't you, that it's quite difficult to explain to someone that one day or at one time of day, you might have patchy vision in a particular part of your visual field. And at another time, that patchy blurred area of vision may have shifted to a different spot within your visual field. So often there are misunderstandings linked to this condition, as is often the case with any visual impairment. 
but the variable nature of diabetic retinopathy means that it, it often takes um, some, some simulation, but also some uh, kind of understanding in terms of how best to, to accommodate. It might be completely fine to read text in a large font uh, when the vision is good, but actually when the, the floaters are in a particular part of the visual field and vision is less um, efficient for the individual, that may be more difficult. So we often hear that people with diabetic retinopathy will switch between uh, using, for example, large text or perhaps using a feature like read aloud or synthetic speech. So it's worth being aware that for some conditions, variability is a significant issue and diabetic retinopathy would be, would be a prime example of that. We've now moved to the uh, illustration around macular degeneration. Lewis, could you um, whiz us through this slide, please? Sure, and I'll be very quick on this one. Macular degeneration, it's um, very similar to retinitis pigmentosa, but instead of losing the peripheral vision, uh, what's affected is the central vision. Uh, and so it, it, again, it's a condition that affects the retina, which is um, the photoreceptor cells in the back of the eye. It's just the pattern of vision loss is somewhat uh, different. And this is one of the leading uh, causes of vision loss, um, especially because it's uh, related to age. So among people that are over 50, uh, this is uh, a, a big source of uh, vision loss. And next slide. So in terms of visual adjustments, I think it's important to emphasize um, and some of the key points that we've made um, around variability. And that's really where um, the formats like EPUB really shine uh, because we have a number of different options we can choose from. Um, and again, it depends on uh, what your needs are in terms of the progression of your condition or even within a day. Um, I may need something early in the morning and then as my vision gets, uh, you know, uh, so that it's not as, as good later in the day, I can use a different set of features. Uh, so I can adjust the font size. Um, I can choose different fonts. Um, I can uh, choose from different color combinations. Uh, this is a feature that I often use. Uh, so that I have light text on a dark background and it gives me uh, additional contrast. Um, I can adjust the line spacing and uh, some of the reading apps that we'll look at may have other spacing uh, settings. Um, one that I use uh, quite a bit is the margins. So I like to bring in the content from the margins so that more of it is in my uh, central vision. And then, um, as I said, um, Later in the day, I will often use the read aloud feature uh, that's available on a number of these reading systems uh, to complement um, what I'm reading or maybe just take a break so that I can let my vision restore or rest. Next slide. So um, before we get into the demonstrations of specific products, we wanted to show you what this stuff looks like. Uh, in, in practice. Um, so we've prepared two short videos um, that will show both the concept of visual adjustments and read aloud. For many years, people with print disabilities have needed to make special versions of books and documents to suit their visual needs. These could have been enlarged photocopies, large print editions, or copying pages onto colored paper. However, the ability to adjust the visual presentation is designed right into the EPUB format. Let's see this in action. So, if I have a book open and the print is too small for me, then I can make it larger. And rather than going off the edge of the display, notice how the text magically adjusts to suit the new layout. This is called reflow. It's one of the killer features of EPUB. It means the same file can be read on a laptop with a large screen, or on a smartphone held in portrait mode. I can adjust the size of this window and still read the paragraph without having to pan the text back and forth. People with low vision or specific learning differences often need larger text and in EPUB this is really easy to use. Also, colours are important for many readers with print disabilities and the EPUB format allows for flexible selection of text and background colours. This reading app has more than 20 combinations. I'll just switch this back to black on white. 
Now the choice of font can make a big difference to the reading speed and comprehension for some learning disabilities and for people with some eye conditions and it's easy to change the font of an EPUB to find one that suits you. So with the ability to change the size of words and images, with magical text reflow and the facility to choose your own colours and fonts, EPUB offers many ways to suit the visual needs of readers with print disabilities. Let's move straight in then to the high level overview of Read Aloud. People with low vision will sometimes use text to speech to increase their reading speed and reduce eye strain. This is often referred to as Read Aloud and we can use this capability in this EPUB from Pearson. It's built right into this EPUB reader I'm using on Windows. I'll just start it from the toolbar. Issues of assessment. In early childhood education, essential questions surround what constitutes appropriate and inappropriate practice and what is best for children and families. Assessment is no exception. Notice how the visual highlighting emphasizes the current line being spoken and each word as it's being read. Next, I can use the controls to move the read aloud further ahead in the text. Blurring the line between assessment and teaching. As an early childhood professional, you are constantly multitasking. I can change the speed of the read aloud. And te teaching children. Children. But many believe that the emphasis on assess assessment leads to teaching to the test. This leads to children knowing how to fill in a bubble in a scan And I could select a different voice. Many fear that the em emphasis on accountability is creating an educational culture that puts test scores ahead of intellectual growth. Read aloud works very well in EPUB. It complements the visual adjustment capabilities and the format's designed so that the reading order is always followed correctly. So for um, students with low vision, there are many benefits to getting to grips with EPUB. It's the standard for digital books. Something like 80% uh, of higher education textbooks are produced in EPUB in North America now. Uh, and in many ways, the, the production processes means that EPUB is produced first and something like PDF is, is something they may have to do a special version of. Um, we've shown you the reflowable text and the ability to be able to read the same text on different size screens or to be able to resize the text and not have to do the panning and scanning. And with the ability of having adjustable fonts, spacing and colors, um, these are all built in and kind of designed into the EPUB uh, technology. Students, of course, could interact with the entire book. So they could be going to references or uh, links to glossaries that could be right across uh, towards the end of the uh, print book. And as you'll see, there are multiple reading systems out there which, um, which do vary in what they offer and will offer many different choices, uh, including many mobile options. So as we go through this uh, transition to EPUB, which is happening really fast, uh, then students really have to get to grips with how EPUB offers them some great advantages uh, for them if they have low vision. Something that comes up whenever we talk with educators um, around EPUB is the challenge around, um, but because we move and reflow the pages, uh, what is shown on the screen is no longer a one-to-one -one correspondent to what's in the print book. Therefore, how could you know what page you're on? So the good news is that publishers uh, now are putting uh, page level markup into their EPUBs. So whether you're on screen two or 2000, you can know where you are in the text in relation to the print book. Uh, and so in um, reading systems like digital editions and edge, red shelf, um, bookshelf and so on, you'll see that there's a go to page um, function, which will take you to the exact same place uh, in the book as if you were leafing through the paper book looking for page 102 um, or whatever. So go to page, we know it's important. I'm here to reassure you that's built, being built into both the, uh, the digital um, editions that are coming from the publishers uh, and into the reading apps as well. So we, um, we could do all sorts of demos for you. I mean, we've, um, we've probably got more demos than we have time for, um, but we just wanted to kind of uh, take you through the sorts of things that we'd be able to show you. Um, and one thing to let you know is that there are EPUB reading systems shipping as standard uh, on the devices you already have. Uh, so the product called Apple Books, which comes on iOS and Mac OS, uh, that's their book reading app that is all based on EPUB. 
So you could take an EPUB that's being provided to you through, say, the Access Text Network, and you don't have to download an app. It's already on your MacBook or on your iPhone. Uh, there's an app there that you can uh, use to read that. Similarly, on Android, Google Play, their book reading app, that's all based around EPUB. And the demonstration you saw just back there of visual adjustments and of read aloud, they were using the browser that ships on Windows 10 and that natively supports EPUB as well. You just click on an EPUB in Windows Explorer and it would open it up in Edge. There are some uh, other apps as well. So there's Vital Source Bookshelf. This is a very popular uh, platform for um, providing um, textbooks in higher education uh, in the US and many other countries. And they have uh, their Bookshelf app available across Android, iOS, macOS, Windows, and web. Uh, and Redshelf is one of their other um, leading providers. And what's interesting about them is that their app uh, runs on the web through a browser. So you don't actually have to download any software. You could use the browser on your smartphone or on your device. And that's how you access um, the, the, the books that way. And then a couple of um, specialist apps that are designed particularly for people with um, visual impairment and other reading disabilities, Dolphin Easy Reader and Voice Dream Reader. So, Lewis, you are going to take us away with the first demo. What have you got for us? That is right, Richard. I'm going to be, uh, let me uh, take over the screen here. Okay, you should be able to see my screen. And I will be demoing two apps. I'm going to be demoing uh, Books, which is the built-in option uh, for reading EPUB on iOS devices as well on the Mac. And the experience is very similar on iOS and on the Mac. So I'll go ahead and launch uh, Books. And then uh, here you can see my bookshelf where I have the different EPUB titles that I, I want to read. I'm gonna choose one uh, here uh, from Macmillan. I'm gonna open up that e EPUB book. And uh, there are a few options you can use here to adjust the display. Uh, but you need to tap on the center of the screen in order to display the uh, different controls that are available. So again, I can tap and it brings up the controls uh, at the top of the screen. And then one of those options is indicated by uh, two letter A's, big A, little a. Um, that's where you can find a lot of these display settings. So I'll tap on that option. It will bring up some uh, settings that I can adjust. One of them is the text size. And you can see on the page that as I resize the text, that image is going to move around. That's a feature of the reflow. And then I can also adjust some other options. For example, I can choose a different font. Uh, on iOS devices, there's a special font called San Francisco. This is a font that was uh, specifically designed for uh, displaying content on devices with retina displays. So it's a really nice, clean, sharp font. That's the one that I prefer when I'm reading on my tablet. And then um, the other thing you can do is you can change the theme. And there's four options here. You can uh, set it up with a sepia background. So it takes away some of the contrast. There's a night reading mode where you get a gray background with some light text on it. And then the option that I use most of the time when I'm reading is the uh, full high contrast option. So here you get a, a black background with some light text on it. And what's nice is that you can also set this up to adjust for you automatically uh, by choosing the auto night theme option. Uh, so that will use the time of the day uh, to switch the theme so that you have higher contrast. And the final option here is that you can switch to a scrolling view. And when you uh, change to the scrolling view, you're now moving from the uh, top of the page to the bottom. You're scrolling through the page in that way, as opposed to doing a page flip. And I happen to like uh, that option. So I use that quite a bit. So those are some of the uh, display options that you have. Again, this is books. It's the built-in app on iOS but it's also available on the Mac and it has very similar options for adjusting the display. Next, I'm going to show you Voice Dream Reader and this is more of a specialist, uh, a special app. 
It's a third party app that you can uh, purchase on the app store. And I will go ahead and launch the same title. And you have a few uh, additional options that you don't have with the built-in books app here. Once again, you will find um, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little a and a big A. And um, I can also uh, perform a double tap with three fingers on iOS devices and zoom in on that so that you can see it a little bit better. And then I can double tap with three fingers again to hide the zoom. And once I tap on that icon, it brings up the visual settings. And while I'm in here, there's two different views, rich text and plain text. But most of the options that I'm gonna show you will work best on the plain text display. Uh, so for example, I can choose font and spacing. Uh, once again, if I want to choose a different font, so I don't want to use that Georgia font. Instead, I want to go to something like the chalkboard font. I can do that. I can adjust the text size in one of two different ways. I can use the plus and minus options, or I can just move the slider and the text will uh, adjust on the page. And as I mentioned um, earlier, a number of these apps have options for the spacing. And so in Voice Dream Reader, the options are the character spacing, the line spacing, or the margins. And um, I will often adjust the margins so that more of the content is uh, in the center of the display. And that just makes it a little bit easier for me to read the content. You can also uh, change the theme uh, so you can choose from a light uh, theme, a dark one that gives you uh, more contrast, or um, again, to address that variability, you can choose a custom theme. And then for any of these, you can change the colors and you have options of millions of colors here for any of the options for the text, the background, uh, the highlighting that's used during the read aloud for any of these uh, features you can choose um, any colors from this wide palette that's available within this app. And then um, under advanced visual settings, um, an option that I think was designed for people with uh, reading difficulties, but I use it quite a bit myself as well, is the number of lines visible. So I will often turn that on and it basically just adds a mask around most of the screen so that only a few lines of text are available. And so that helps me with tracking, which is an issue for me. Um, there is a read aloud feature built into this app. And so I can turn that on uh, in one of two ways. I can use the controls at the bottom of the screen, or I can just double tap um, on one of these words and it will start reading aloud from that point on. And you may not be able to hear this with the uh, uh, screen sharing that I'm performing, but let's give that a shot. I'll go ahead and pause that. Just wanted to give you a sense of how that works. Uh, you can hear the read out loud. Um, you can uh, change the colors of this highlighting uh, if you prefer. So you can change the highlighting colors for both the words and the lines. And then uh, there are some options for the voices. You can use the built-in iOS voices, or you can purchase some additional commercial voices, and you can adjust the speaking rate in here. Uh, before I turn it over to Robin, I should also mention that there is a built-in uh, reading feature on iOS devices. Uh, it's called Speak Screen. And so that's an option as well if you're using just the built-in books app. Uh, you turn that feature on with a special gesture where you swipe down from the top of the screen with two fingers. And then that will also perform a basic read aloud. And you have to turn on that feature in settings before you can use it. So you have that built-in read aloud feature uh, on iOS or you, some of these apps like the Voice Stream Reader have their own uh, read aloud support. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Robin who is gonna talk to us about Google Playbooks on Android. Okay, so I have here uh, Google Playbooks set up 
And what I'm going to do is have a look at some of the options that there are available. Um, now, it's worth saying at the start of this that very often individuals will use a mix of magnification and uh, increased font sizes. So by using magnification on Android, I'm using one finger to tap three times and you'll notice an orange border appears around the screen and that gives me a magnified mode of what's on screen. But of course, the limitation with that is that I have to pan around the screen um, or indeed pinch to make larger or smaller than the magnification feature. So I'll turn magnification off for one moment. And inside this app, I'm able to bring up by hitting the large A and small A, I'm able to bring up um, text and tone, and I can go in and do very similar things to what Louis has just shown um, in iOS. I can go in and change the fonts to you know, a particular font that works for me. It's often the case for folks with low vision that at certain times of the day, a particular type of font might work better um, for the individual. And maybe as the person gets tired, the size of the font is increased a little bit. A lot of people prefer a dark background as the sun falls. So many people will prefer bright text on a dark background at any time of day, but a lot of low vision people, uh, when natural light falls away and they're reading in artificial light, will prefer to, to flip the, the, the contrast. So you can do that, very similar to iOS, you can do that by having, we've got here white on black. We've also got a uh, dark gray on a, a kind of sepia color. And then, of course, um, black on a white background. I think it's fair to say that a lot of people with low vision will find um, black text on a white background. It can sometimes become quite, quite glary. Um, so it's worth being aware of that. <clears throat> In the same box, you will also notice that it's possible to make the font size smaller and larger. So I've got it as 75% of the standard size. If I touch the T, which is to the right of 75%, round about the center of the screen in the, the dark box, you'll notice that as I touch it, it actually moves up um, in increments. And we can set that to exactly the level that, that, that you like. So for example, here I've set it to 125%. Um, and that is particularly helpful for uh, me. We can also do things like change the line spacing as well, because again, for uh, some individuals, and again, at different times of day, that will be a factor um, in terms of ease of reading. Some people will also prefer the text, for example, to be uh, default or left justified. Um, you've got the option to make that change um, as and when it suits you. So I'll just show you some of the other fonts that are in here, um, just to give you a, a, a sense. So Meriwether is one here that is uh, quite a popular font. Again, some of those fonts, some of these fonts have been designed specifically to be easier for, for people with low vision um, to, to read. Um, we can also do things like we can turn on night light, uh, which makes reading easy. Night light tints your screen amber at night and this makes it easier to read in dim light. So we can do that. Um, and that can also, of course, be set to a timer to work for um, the individual. It's worth saying at this point that it's really helpful for anyone listening to this to take these ideas and try them out with students. I'm constantly surprised by the number of students and indeed adults who are not in education, who've perhaps got their own device but they're not aware of the inbuilt functionality that exists inside the device. And it's actually always a delight to introduce them to these features, especially where they're able to, to make a significant difference to the reading experience. So um, experimenting is absolutely key for, for all of these features. Robin, before you hand over the screen to me, would you just um, show us the, that same device in landscape mode? Because you've been showing it in portrait, because that, that sure. makes an interesting visual difference, doesn't it? It does, Richard, absolutely. And you quite often find, and in fact, when I'm reading, I'm often reading um, with the screen in landscape mode because I'm able to get a longer string of words horizontally. 
Um, and it's and in many ways it's actually more comfortable to hold most devices in landscape mode um, and you can get more on screen and of course the font will also appear larger so that's a really helpful point I think that's particularly the case when you're using a tablet but as smartphones have become larger in recent years that's also becoming increasingly important for users of any smartphone Thank you, Robin. I know we're rushing through these demos, but uh, in the slide deck that you'll have a link to, there is that grid that tells you about the different features that are offered by the different um, apps. So now then, let's move to um, hopefully uh, a video we're going to see um, of the Vital Source uh, bookshelf operating on the Apple Mac. I'm going to demonstrate using Vital Source bookshelf online using the Chrome app on a MacBook. I'll go into Chrome, I'll go to my bookshelf account, and because Chrome has remembered my username and password, it takes me straight to my bookshelf. Here's the last book I was reading. I'll click continue reading and go into it. Now I can use the feature of the trackpad to zoom into the page, makes the text nice and big, but here I have to do that scanning and panning business in order to read the text. Far better that I use the features of the Vital Source EPUB reader to increase the size of the text and now it will reflow it so I get the entire text across the width of the screen. I can change the margins. So here I have full margins, medium, and if I go to um, having short line lengths, it means I can zoom in now and combining this with the reflow feature, uh, I can see nice big text uh, and I'm not having to pan and scan. Let's have a look at the color combinations that are offered to me. I can choose dark, sepia and cyan. I can adjust the fonts. Let's have a look at what we have. Sans serif, old style, modern, humanist, mono space and open dyslexic. I'm going to choose sans serif. And now let's have a look at line height. So I can increase the spacing between the lines, which is really helpful for some folk. Now we're going to look at read aloud. That's hiding over here in the labs piece and I can click on launch to start that. I'll click the play button to start read aloud. Expository strategies. There are many ways to explain things. But and I can move to the next section by clicking on the next button. As they develop their example to demonstrate with specific. Let's pause it there. Let's change the rate of speaking. Analysis to understand something by investigating. And now let's choose a different voice. I will choose one with a little bit of a Scottish lilt. It's parts. Comparison and contrast to highlight similarities and differences. Cause and effect to show causal relationships. Description to make something vivid and concrete. Although these different strategies are sometimes introduced as standalone ways of organizing an essay, the reality is that authors, like Pitts, will often draw on multiple strategies, using whatever tool is most effective to explain the main idea and achieve the writer's purpose. So, uh, we've, we've whizzed through those demos. A reminder that we have the, um, the, the grid here that you're able to look at. It tells you about the different features that exist uh, across the different apps. And there's also uh, uh, new reviews being posted at the link at the bottom here. But Lewis, I wonder if you'd be good enough to take us through this takeaway slide. Absolutely, Richard. Uh, so uh, in terms of takeaways, um, as we mentioned, a, a, key, a few key themes have come through. Uh, one of them is the idea of that variability and then finding a nice match uh, in all of these options that are available with these reading systems when they, uh, you're accessing EPUB. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, low vision students can benefit from reading systems, had visual adjustments and read aloud. And we showed you those in a number of different reading systems across a number of different platforms. Uh, many of them offer the same features. So read aloud, the ability to change the text size, uh, just the background colors, but there may be slight variations. So one system may offer more options for the number of fonts you can choose from or the color combinations and so on. But the important thing is that those features are available uh, for learners to use 
And then uh, what's most important is show learners a variety of options and then empower them to find those settings that work the best for their uh, specific individual needs that they have. And the uh, sort of the analogy that I used is uh, a bicycle in the sense that with a bicycle, you have an adjustable seat. So you don't get a bicycle for somebody who's really tall or somebody who's really short. You just get a bicycle that has an adjustable seat and then a wide range of different people are able to use it. And it's the same thing for me with these reading systems that I can adjust that bicycle seat by adjusting the fonts and the text size and the colors uh, to match my needs, not only um, in terms of my own condition, but in terms of the progression of it and then the time of the day and so on. And there are some extensive reviews of um, these um, reading systems and you can find those at inclusivepublishing.org forward slash RS and then dash accessibility. So you can learn more about what are these specific features that each of these reading systems support. So Dawn, that concludes the uh, set of slides we have. So it's over to you. Hopefully we've got some uh, questions queued up and you can take us through those. I'm sorry we've, we've allowed, um, we haven't quite managed our 20 minutes. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yes, I do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the questioner says, past workshops have shown a go-to page feature. Is this included in EPUB or not? Um, so uh, the go-to page feature um, is in a variety of different reading apps. Um, and I reference some of those on a slide further back. So uh, digital editions, um, it's in uh, Vital Source Bookshelf, uh, it's in Redshelf, um, uh, and so on. So that's one of the things that we uh, evaluate in those um, reviews and tell you about. So GoToPage is supported in EPUB so long as it's been put in by the publisher and it's supported by the reading system. Perfect, thank you. What is the best application for reading college math textbooks such as calculus or statistics? Well, now, now we're getting into some interesting um, space because that whole kind of markup of, um, of maths is kind of um, tricky. It's something that we're working on together with the publishers to make sure that they do the very uh, best they can. All of the publishers have um, their math marked up in beautiful math ML, uh, but often it comes out in the books as an image. So what you're looking for then is uh, a reading app that allows you to manipulate uh, the image in the way that suits that individual reader. So um, actually some of the most basic ones uh, come out well there. So the uh, books app that was shown by Lewis right at the start, uh, that has a feature where if you tap on an image, it makes it full screen, for example. Um, and Edge, the one that's built into Windows, uh, if you click on an image in an EPUB there, that makes it full screen. So those maths um, formulae uh, are typically included in an EPUB as an image. And so you're looking at uh, a reading system that um, is able to basically manipulate the images in a way that, that suits you. Um, I think that's the, uh, the, the best I can do with that answer for the moment. The things like read aloud typically at the moment will not be supported because it's an image. There could be some alt text in there, but typically uh, read aloud is designed not to read out the alt text. So yeah, it's about being able to manipulate that, um, that visual display. All right, thank you. Uh, can you change the way that Vital Source highlights the text? I think they may be referring to the synchronized highlighting. Maybe? So this is on the read aloud. So this is in the labs at the moment. So it's in beta. Um, I actually found that it worked uh, with the default settings of black text on a white background. And when I changed the themes, uh, the, uh, the visual highlighting went away. So in one sense, yeah, you can turn it off <laughs> by using that trick because it's in, so I believe that's, that's the kind of current state of play. I'm not sure I would need to go and have a look at uh, the platforms in addition to the web version of um, Vital Source to see whether or not it offers different options. But I believe that there aren't, you haven't got the customization that you would have, for example, in, um, 
invoice stream reader that Lewis was showing, showing us there. It's in labs though, they ask for feedback, so that's a great suggestion. All right, will any of the EPUB apps allow for text extraction? Uh, Lewis, I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking, so do you want to take this one or? It, it really depends on, on the, uh, the app and also, um, well, actually, I'll let you answer that one, Richard. I'm not too familiar. Yeah, so uh, typically um, you can do things like make notes in an EPUB reader that you're in, uh, but also cut and paste text out of it. Um, so, um, uh, so the answer is yes for, sh for short pieces. If you're reading and you want to quote something, then you would just select it and copy it and then uh, post it. And sometimes it gives you some citation information in what it then puts in the clipboard um, as well. It'll vary a bit between the apps because that's not the EPUB standard there. It's about what the reading app has done for you. Um, but they're all set up for studying and, and reading. So yes, it's un, I, I can't think of one that doesn't allow you to, um, to extract text from the EPUB. Whether we were talking about extracting a larger chunk, like a whole chapter or something, I don't know, but short pieces, yeah. Lewis, did you want to add yeah. to that? Are you, are you happy with yeah. that response? Yes, and, and absolutely. And there are some of these apps also include, uh, as you mentioned, some uh, study tools. So you can uh, highlight, you can take notes, and I make use of the highlighting quite a bit. And then in some of the apps, like the Voice Stream Reader app that I was showing, I can also use the highlighting to navigate to specific sections of the book. So I can uh, bring up a list of my highlights and then go to that section of the book where I've highlighted it. We're possibly drifting slightly off topics, so, but some of them yep. will allow you to do audio highlighting, uh, sorry, audio notes as well. Yep. So you would highlight a piece of text and then record something uh, into that. So that might be useful if you find typing on a small keyboard difficult, for example, maybe making audio note is, uh, is easier. Excellent. We have made our way through all of the questions thus far. If anyone out there has um, any more questions, please do post them in the Q&A. Um, and I want to give our presenters an um, option if there's anything else that you would like to cover. Um, now is your chance. If no more questions come in, then we will wrap things up. Well, we have, we have more demos that we can do, but maybe feels a bit, um, we, so we can do that. Maybe people can indicate on the Q&A. We have a demo queued up, which is demonstrating another mobile um, reading app called Easy Reader. It's one that's designed specifically for people with, um, with print disabilities, but can read uh, EPUBs. People have asked us some specific questions around, for example, copying and pasting uh, and go to page and so on. So uh, from the link that you saw on the earlier uh, page that run around uh, reading system accessibility, if you want to, that will take you th right through to some very detailed evaluations on a website called epubtest.org. And we test for these very specific things, the ability to um, pay, cut, for example, uh, text above 400 characters, uh, the ability to go to page, the ability to uh, change the visual highlighting on the read aloud. These are all things we test for and we publish the results on those. So if you want to dig deep, that's available to you, even if it's um, sometimes a bit tricky to answer them on the hoof um, in, a, in a webinar. I so Dawn, do did you get any, any, yeah, go ahead. Um, would you reiterate which app was demoed second? And so I know the first two videos that were played back to back was all Microsoft Edge. Correct. Which one came after that? They're probably uh, referring to my demo and uh, I showed books first on iOS. That's the built in uh, ebook reader app. And then I show voice dream reader. And that's a commercial app. And that was all on your iPad tablet? Correct. Great. So maybe it would be helpful just to run through the demos we did and the sequence of them. So we did the two short um, videos that were high level. That was in Microsoft Edge. Then Lewis showed us uh, books on his iPad, followed by Voice Dream Reader on his iPad. Then we transitioned to Robin, who showed us Google Play, which is the built-in EPUB reader on Android. And then I showed um, 
uh, vital source bookshelf online which is the crowd cr the browser accessed version of their reading um, app Perfect. Dawn, are we looking at uh, wrapping up or showing another video? It's now kind of four minutes before the top of the hour, so. I think we should wrap up. Um, and did, I'm sorry I, if I missed it, I was answering questions in the Q&A. Did you share with them where they can view that extra video or are we going to post that on our resources page? Let's post that on the resources page. So as an extra bonus gift, then the video that we, the demo that we didn't have time to show you, which is Dolphin Easy Reader on Android. They also have a version for iOS. Both apps are free. Both apps are great. Uh, you can see that and that'll be posted along with the slide deck. So you can go right along and view that separately. Thank you. And if you would go to the last slide. All right, everybody, thank you so much for attending. And thank you, Richard, Luis, and Robin for presenting very excellent information. Again, the resources page where you'll have all of your links and videos and recordings is bit.ly slash epub atn. I hope everyone has a great day. We will see you in two weeks, not one week this time, but two weeks. All right, take care all, bye-bye.